I'm Jason Alexander. I'm a professor in the Department of Philosophy, Logic, and Scientific Method. My primary areas of research are game and decision theory, particularly concentrating on evolutionary game theory, but I also have broader interests in philosophy of social science and philosophy of science. Game theory is essentially the analysis of interdependent decision problems. That is, a decision problem where the best choice for a person to make actually depends on what everyone else does. It's called game theory because you can think of the simplest illustrations of those kinds of decision problems as being generated by parlor games such as poker, bridge, backgammon, or chess. But it turns out that much of life actually has that form as well. There's a long tradition in philosophy of attempting to identify the relationship between, say, moral theory and considerations of rationality. Thomas Hobbes and Leviathan argued that self-interested agents would actually choose to elect an all-powerful sovereign to lead their government because that would be the best way that they could actually avoid the problems generated by living in the state of nature, the famous war of all against all. In a different vein, Kant argued that the categorical imperative would be also derivable from considerations of rationality. So all rational agents would act according to its rule. So thinking about the relationship between rationality and morality has this long tradition, and so it was only natural that game theory, as a tool for considering how rational agents make decisions, would be applied to these kinds of questions as well. Evolutionary game theory was developed based upon the realization that many of the problems species face in an evolutionary context have the same kind of interdependent decision problem character as those problems studied by game theory. Traditional game theory assumes that we're talking about perfectly rational agents. The individuals are assumed to have all of the relevant information for the decision problem at hand. It also assumes that they're capable of solving arbitrarily complex computational or mathematical problems. Evolutionary game theory, since we're talking about animals, species, which are you know, imperfectly rational, if they're rational at all, don't have those kinds of capabilities. Evolutionary game theory just assumes that the individuals face problems with a certain strategic structure, not that they are capable of thinking in any sophisticated way at all about how to best approach those problems. Essentially, Moral theory tells one how one ought to live one's life, what it is that you should do. There's a second area of philosophy known as metaethics, which looks at questions about the justification or the grounding of moral beliefs. Evolutionary game theory is relevant for trying to answer those kinds of questions. The primary way I apply evolutionary game theory to these philosophical questions is by using computer simulations. I write a computer program that attempts to model the behavior of a population of individuals, the individuals are playing some game which represents a particular decision problem, how to allocate resources, whether to cooperate or defect in certain uh, problems of trust. By looking at the way certain behaviors are initially distributed across the individuals in the population, look to see what actually ends up evolving over time. Ideally, one would like to find considerable agreement between those behaviors that turn out to be evolutionarily advantageous and those behaviors which we take to be morally obligatory. In this particular simulation, you can see the individuals represented on the screen. They're color-coded to indicate what strategy they actually follow. In the case of trying to allocate a cake that's been sliced into 10 pieces, there are 11 possible strategies. Ask for nothing, all the way up to asking for 10 slices, i.e. the whole cake. When two people play this game, they each have the strategy that they follow, the number of pieces of cake that they would like to receive. If the sum of their two requests is compatible, it adds up to less than or equal to the 10 slices of cake that are available, each person gets what they want. If the demands are incompatible, so say one person wants six slices of cake and the other wants seven, no person ends up with anything. After they play this game, they then look around, say, their immediate surroundings, and they look at how well other people did, and then they imitate the strategy that was most successful. As you watch the simulation unfold over time, you'll notice that there's one particular strategy, represented as this bright green, which tends to spread 
throughout the entire population. That is the strategy of sharing the cake equally, or asking for exactly half. As the simulation runs, you can see that that outcome, where asking for half comes to dominate the population, will always evolve regardless of the initial conditions in which we start the population. This suggests that the reason why we think you ought to share the cake equally in perfectly symmetric situations is because that is the most evolutionarily advantageous outcome. It's as if we've been evolutionarily programmed to treat that as what we ought to do. In my book, The Structural Evolution of Morality, I defend one view as to how we are to think about moral theory. Each of us have our own particular preferences over what we would like to realize in life. But the point is, our preferences are not all compatible. Sometimes what I want conflicts with what you want, and vice versa. Morality, by providing a set of principles in terms of how we ought to behave, provides the best way for each of us to satisfy our preferences to the greatest extent possible, given the constraints placed by other people. One implication of this view, which some people find disturbing, is that it would appear to make morality entirely relative. Well, in a sense, that's true. Morality becomes relative in that it becomes context-specific. But at the same time, morality is also objective in the sense that there is a fact of the matter over what behavior maximally satisfies your preferences, given the constraints placed by other people. The th key thing to note here is that the antonym of relative is not objective. Those aren't competing notions. The antonym of relative is absolute. The antonym of objective is subjective. So, in my view, morality is both objective and relative.